I can't see what I'm doing. But no lights. We don't want them to know we're having a party. <laughs> but I need spills. So spill it. Spills, thrills, laughs, and games. <laughs> this may even turn out to be a surprise party. What's a surprise? Uh-oh. -uh. Not yet. When? Better have a drink first. That'll put hair on your chest. No fair guessing. <laughs> Hello and welcome once again to The Cinephiles, where each week we enter the world of a great film, we explore its themes, the history, the filmmaking, and the influence it has on us today. My name is Steve Morris. I'm a filmmaker and directing instructor in Los Angeles, California. My name is John Roca. I'm a <laughs> voiceover artist, host of numerous shows here in L.A., frequent guest on shows here in L.A., and occasionally an actor. And a just well-known man about town. Yeah, well, yeah, the outlaw and all things, yes. Um, <laughs> I think that should be the new slogan, the outlaw and all things, yes. Yes, yeah, should be right there on a T-shirt. Um, and today, I'm really excited to do a movie that I think you are really excited to do. Absolutely. Uh, when you mentioned this a couple of weeks ago, or a few weeks ago, I was like, yeah, this actually, this, is, this would be a great one to do, because a lot of people kind of quietly love this film. It's yeah. not one of the ones that people like throw up in the air all the time when they talk about their favorite comedies, but it's certainly one that people speak of with reverence, you know? And so it's it's interesting. It almost transcends a cla a comedy genre to become a classic film. I, yeah, absolutely. So I'm excited so. to talk about it. Well, and it is listed, I think, as AFI's number one comedy yeah. of all time. Not a surprise. Yeah, and of course we're talking about Billy Wilder's Some Like It Hot, 1959, yeah. starring... Jack Lemmon, Tony Curtis, and of course, Marilyn Monroe. Yeah, the lovely, beautiful Marilyn Monroe. Very, very beautiful. And Joey Brown and George Rath. So many amazing character actors that litter this throughout this film that's fantastic. Absolutely. Um, and let, let's let's just jump right into yeah, it. Yeah, sure. And it's funny, like in this movie, we kind of have, you know, sometimes we give some little bi biographical material right. about various people involved. And right. usually I try to pick the most important person. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this, there are four big people in this movie. Yeah. And, and I want to start with Billy Wilder. Sure. Um, who is... Uh, was born in Austria. He's Jewish. He uh, became a journalist. Mm -hmm. Escaped just just as the Nazis were taking <sighs> over to Paris. Mm -hmm. Essentially, his whole family was killed mm -hmm. in the Holocaust. Uh, became a filmmaker in Paris, and then immediately came to Hollywood. Mm -hmm. Became a naturalized citizen, and he is. In addition to being uh, one of the great directors of all time, he is one of the great screenwriters of all time. Yeah, yeah his first film he wrote in Hollywood is Ninochka. Wow, the directed by Ernst Lubitsch. Yeah, yeah, Garbo. Um, and then he just, just the list goes on and on. Double and and what's interesting about him, by the way, is that he goes from these really bright, mm -hmm. sparkling comedies like mm -hmm. Some Like It Hot to just being the noir guy yeah. as well and being able to handle some drama. So he does, you know, uh, he does Double Indemnity, Sunset Boulevard, right. The Lost Weekend. Yeah. I mean, that Lost Weekend is a heavy... I recently saw that for the first time two months ago. Uh, Ray Milland. Ray Milland, Lost yeah. Weekend. And Ray Milland had like, no one had wanted him for the role. And so he really, because he was a B-movie actor, essentially, and he tackled yeah. it with gusto. But the script is so fantastic. What it explores for that time is amazing. And that's what's so great about Billy Wilder is his ability to excel at whatever genre he decides to tackle. He really yeah. is just uh, an anomaly, a unicorn, you might say, in the film world, because not a lot of directors and writers can do that so successfully. Absolutely. And he is very much a... A writing craft guy. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, he wasn't interested in Orson Welles' crazy camera work or, <laughs> you know, he right. wasn't into, he, into big, amazing concepts. Yeah. He didn't want to do big budgets. He wanted to do perfectly well crafted, well written movies. Yeah. And you see, there's the list just goes on and on. There's um, Stalag 17, there's The Seven Year Itch, which is the first movie he does with Marilyn. Right. You know, he does The Apartment, has this long relationship with Jack Lemon. I yeah. mean, the, the, the He's one of our great directors mm -hmm. and one where for those of you who want to be screenwriters, go back and yeah, you know, go back and go through them. One of them that I love by the way is uh, the Danny Kaye movie A Song Is Born. Oh, okay. Uh, which I just it's one of my guilty pleasure yeah. musicals. It's yeah. so much fun. I don't think I've ever seen that one. Oh, uh, it's really good. Yeah. And it's I a, love Danny Kaye. It's a remake of he did a, a I think it's called Ball of Fire. Okay. Which is uh, about people writing an encyclopedia, and then there's the story with mobsters, not unlike, uh, right. not unlike some like it hot. Right. Uh, and this one is they're doing a musical encyclopedia, and there's a singer for some band, and Danny Kaye is an intellectual who falls in love with the mafia girlfriend singer. Mm. And it's really, I mean, I could watch Danny Kaye all the time. Yeah, I just love Danny Kaye. Yeah, it's so he's so funny. One, by the way, I want to do for cinephiles. Yeah. 
is The Court Jester. Yes, The Court Jester. We absolutely have to do it sometime. Such a good film, okay. yes, absolutely. But we digress. Yes. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and the other person I just want to, we, we have to talk about, and I think she towers over the whole film, is Marilyn Monroe. Well, and this is what's amazing watching it this summer. I don't know why I didn't notice it in any of my previous viewings of this movie. She gets top billing. Oh, yeah. She's first. She's the biggest star. That's There's amazing no question about me. it. Yeah, it's amazing to me. Yeah. Um, her, let's, let's talk a little bit about our, yeah. her history. The, the first thing I wanted to say about her is that th we talked about this idea of charisma and in, in uh, talking about other actors, yeah. we talked about with Jack Nicholson, we talked about Charlie Chaplin, we talked about it with various people. Marilyn Monroe is another one of those people who just, she just sparkles on the screen. Yeah, she you really can't. Wow take her eyes off her you can't quantify this woman this is legitimately there are just some people that you see on screen or you experience their energy or their essence and you just can't quantify them i think young brando i think Marilyn. Yeah. i think james dean yep these are people that when you see them you're just like this is a whole nother level of human that i don't i i can only admire and and be in awe of but in no way can i well, and you can't uh, understand. You, 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 you can't. You're right. You can't quantify. It. Yeah. You don't understand. Like I know that something is affecting me. Yes. But I don't understand <laughs> what it is. Right. Well, and the thing about her, I was thinking about this, is that she falls into a very, very small category, which is yeah. like if you go. Here's my example of it. If you go up to Hollywood Boulevard and you go in front of the Chinese theater, yeah. you're going to see a whole bunch of characters. You're going to yeah. see Superman. You're going to see Batman, Spider Man. You're going to see some Transformers. You're going to see Captain Jack Sparrow. Yeah. And there's only three people you will see that are themselves mm -hmm. which is charlie chaplin elvis right and marilyn monroe and, marilyn monroe. and, and in each of those cases those people created a persona yeah. which is not them but we perceive as them yeah like you can picture johnny depp and not picture Captain Jack Sparrow. Right, 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 right. But it's very hard to picture Charlie Chaplin and not picture the Little Tramp. Yeah. Or Elvis and not see him all Elvisy. Yeah, and this is why Universal Studios, where I work, has a Marilyn. They have Marilyns right. that come and walk around the park, Chaplins that walk around the park. It's for that reason. There is just, they are just uh, incredible, uh, uh, incredible persons, incredible energy, incredible icons to be around, and they, so much so. But even more than Charlie Chaplin, because Charlie Chaplin isn't Charlie Chaplin. Right, he's exactly. the tramp. He's the tramp. Marilyn is playing Marilyn. Mar that yeah. is Marilyn. And From of course, Seven Year Itch, yeah. That's not Marilyn. Right, right, right. You know, right. like she's born Norma Jean. Yeah. What's her last name? Uh, oh, I don't forget. I forget what it is. I get we'll it call her Norma Jean. Norma Jean. So she's born Norma Jean, and she has a really, really tough childhood. Yes. She had multiple foster homes. Mm -hmm. She has a mom who was a paranoid schizophrenic. Right. Right. Spent most of her time institutionalized. She was sexually abused, married young. Married young, yeah. Yeah, like real, this is really tough. Yeah. Began as a, a pinup girl, mm -hmm. uh, became a studio player for Fox, and always really struggling in the late 40s, early 50s, yeah. disrespected. And, you know, we had to say that Marilyn was sexually active yeah. with many many powerful men that she interacted with okay. uh, as she kind of moved her way up in her career right. and we could say different things about this and this is part of the mystery i think of maryland which is mm -hmm. one thing we could say is oh these are powerful men taking advantage of this woman in need this young woman coming mm -hmm. to hollywood we could say there's some that might say oh this is a woman who is you know a climber using yeah. her sexuality to get ahead we could say that this is a woman who didn't care about the sexual mores at her time, was perfectly comfortable with her own sexuality. Or we could say that this is a woman who was deeply troubled and was vulnerable and was desperately looking for love in ways that really got her hurt and injured. Yeah, but I think another way is this determination through it all that to achieve something you know what i'm saying absolutely and, and i think that's to be whatever you want to characterize it and that's your own personal thing for anybody listening or, or us talking about it i think the thing that always sticks out for me is this is a woman that at every turn could have been dismissed yes. pushed aside thrown away uh and kept going forward and in fact her list of husbands is is a who's who of oh, intelligent sure. people and people of accomplishment, yeah. you know. And so, other than the first husband, obviously, but like she, her determination. She, you know, she's a redhead or she's a brown haired or she's a brunette or something. She converts herself into this thing. She puts on the weight. She 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 leans into it, but and and she finds a strength. She negotiates the contracts with it to get herself. Absolutely. Like, so there's a there's a she like she's a young girl who it's almost like King Arthur, right? What we see in Excalibur, young, bright eyed, bushy tailed. 
uh, walking into the world, what am I this? And then by the end, this grizzled veteran. She is, by the end, a veteran of the wars, but the scars were too deep. Very deep. And that's the unfortunate uh, tragedy of her because she could have been, I think, in our time, an incredible icon with incredible strength and power and determination would have found solace in other women who would who would bol- bolster that. But at this time in our country's history, it wasn't that kind of thing. It was kind of frowned upon because she got a lot of shit from other actresses who were oh, jealous yeah. of her sexual uh, sex appeal, thinking it wasn't her talent, that it was her sex appeal. But she transcends that shit. And that's what's so fascinating about her. And that's why I respect her very much. Well, and, and A, the thing I would say is that she's unknowable yeah like th- that's yeah. just like who she was i think of all those different motivations that i listed i think it's probably all of them yeah. in some ways mm-hmm. and we don't get to really know and, and the one thing we do know is that that persona is and, and what all these other actresses complain about her sex appeal yeah that was consciously built yeah of course it was they were refining the hair mm-hmm. they were refining the makeup mm-hmm. refining the behavior all of that stuff was a character that she put yeah. on and what that relationship between that character and the real Marilyn is, we're not going to know. Yeah. You know, maybe Joe DiMaggio and Arthur Miller know. Yeah. You know, who are two, two of her most famous husbands. Right. Um, but we don't really get to know. Well, Rita Hayworth said this too one time. She said, you know, people go to sleep with Gilda, but they wake up with me. Yeah. And that's that's the thing that's like the truth, right? We create this, we believe what we see on the screen to be real. Even in a very small context, as the outlaw, people think... I'm this way in real life and it's like no one would be around me if I was this way in real life like and but people buy into this whole idea of it because sometimes they just get lost in the in the, you do a character so well they think there's no way you're not that person you well know and what it's I'm and it's like what's hard is there is some of the outlaws in you sure there's of course. truth there I can't bring that out if it wasn't there right yeah it's funny I, this is a digression but uh I listen to fresh air all the time with yeah. Terry gross she's a great interviewer but when she interviews artists she particularly writers, she always asks, how is this like your life? Yeah. That's always the question. And as if there's a one-to-one relationship between the things, the artists, the experience right. and the things that they do. And the connection is much more ephemeral. It's like something might be inspired by a thing in your life, but that doesn't mean that that's what happened. Right. It, 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 there's truth there, but it isn't the whole truth. Mm-hmm. And, and and this is really, and this is certainly true of Marilyn Monroe, yeah. which is there's, this is coming from her. Yeah. But how that relates to the real her, we don't get to know. Right, and it's a fuzzy line, Steve, between yeah. how much of this it's was almost crafted. the fuzzy end of the lollipop. <laughs> yeah, oh, well, nice reference to the line in the movie. But like, uh, this is an interesting situation because where's the how fuzzy is the line between her being manipulated to be and created, right. and how much of this that she owns later on in life as she becomes a woman? How much of this does she own and and, and realize that this is the exchange for her power? You know, and so who knows? And well, it's, and, it's, and, it's, it's, and it's that's it's, why I hesitate to call her a victim. I hesitate to call her a victim. Oh, I, 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 it's, it's. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, and she's also she's a she's certainly I would say a victim of her own success. Sure. Well, you know what I mean. In that way, yes. Yeah. And of course, victim of sexual harassment, victim of sexual abuse. Absolutely. I'm not talking about that. I'm saying, uh, uh, I think by calling her a victim overall of her life. That you remove her determination, her ability, her achievements, her successes. Right. In my opinion, I agree. Yeah. Totally agree. All right, let's get into yep. the movie. Enough, enough talk about this. <laughs> we start in a hearse. Yes. And uh, and a cop car comes up behind it. They pull machine guns out of the roof of the hearse, and we're in the middle of a pretty good car chase. Yeah, right. It's like a beginning of a Bond movie. All yeah. of a sudden, it's a car chase. And there's this one spin out of the cop yeah. car that is a really good stunt. Yeah. That is a great stunt. Yeah. Uh, and as then we see in the hearse that they open up the coffin and booze is pouring out of it right. because of course it's Chicago it's 1929 and it's the middle of prohibition and these are bootleggers yeah um, and, and one thing that we had to say about this movie is this movie is like to might be the first like meta movie mm. because not only is it referencing a whole bunch of kinds of gangster movies from right. the 30s but it actually is bringing the stars of those movies yeah. like George Raft yeah. into this movie or yeah. Edward G. Robinson Jr. who's flipping a coin right. the guy picks up a grapefruit at one point and is going to smash someone's face with it yeah the public uh, enemies yeah we, we yeah. got Pat O'Brien who's been playing cops and guys yeah. like this in these kinds of and movies and played Root, Newt Rockney played in, Newt Rockney yeah uh, no uh, yeah Oh. In, in the in the Ronald Reagan movie, wait, but is Newt Rockney Newt Rockney's not the coach, is he? Yeah, Newt Rockney's is. the okay. coach. Yeah. All right, sorry. Um, <laughs> Sports, Steve. I'm familiar. I've heard of them. Um, okay, uh, uh, so we we get to uh, this uh, funeral home. Yeah, 
and there's Pat O'Brien and it's a bunch of cops and Pat O'Brien goes into the funeral home. He knows the secret code word mm. that he got from Charlie Toothpick. <laughs> <laughs> Poor Charlie Toothpick. <laughs> We're all right in the middle of this gangster film. Yeah, it's so great. You know, it's kind of a prologue. This is, and what's interesting thing in comedy, in, in doing a comedy, one of the things you want to get to really fast is your first laugh. Yeah. Because the first laugh lets the audience know it's okay to laugh. This movie's not in a rush. No. We're really in a gangster movie for the first uh, seven or eight minutes. Right. But what, help, what helps us move into the comedy moments is Pat O'Brien's delivery of this character, right? Yeah. It is a little over the top. It's straightforward. It's all this kind of stuff yeah. and the way he delivers it. So already your, your, your sensibilities are leaning towards a com comedic uh, uh, tone and before the first joke is made. Right, which, which we go into this great speakeasy that's behind yeah. like the organ or something in the, in the funeral home. Right. The waiter comes up, and this is like the first sort of funny moment, I think, yes. is you know, he, he makes, Pat O'Brien says, oh, I've been on the wagon or something, and the, the waiter goes, oh, no, 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 we just serve coffee here. Coffee? Scotch coffee, vodka coffee, gin <laughs> right. coffee, bourbon coffee. So he gets his little drink. In walks our big bad guy, Spats Columbo, played by the great George Raft. Yeah. Who is a veteran of gangster films. And new gangsters in real life. Like friends with Bugsy yeah. Siegel. Yeah, this guy, yeah. interesting history in Hollywood. This guy's this guy is hooked up. Yep. And just as we're sort of setting uh, that stuff up, we slowly pan over to the band. Yeah. At least these two guys in the band. Jack Lemon and Tony Curtis. Say, Joe, tonight's the night, isn't it? I'll say. What? No, tonight's the night we get paid. That's good. Why? Oh, I've got fiddling among my back teeth. i got to see a dentist tomorrow. Dennis, we've been out of work for four months. You want to blow your first week's pay on your teeth? Oh, well, it's, it's just a filling here. I have to be gold. Yeah, have to be gold. How can you be so selfish? We owe back rent. We're in for $89 to Moe's Delicatessen. Three Chinese lawyers are suing us because our check bounced at the laundry. We borrowed money from every girl in the line. Oh, you're right. Well, of course I'm First right. thing tomorrow, we'll pay everybody a little something on account, huh? Oh, no, we don't. We don't? No, first thing tomorrow, we go out to the dog track and put the whole bundle on greased lightning. Greased lightning? You're going to bet my money on a dog? He's a shoo and I got it for Max the waiter. His brother-in-law is the electrician that wise the rabbit. What are you giving me with a rabbit? Look at the odds. He's 10 to 1 tomorrow. We'll pay everybody. Suppose he loses. What are you worried about? This job is going to last a long time. But suppose it doesn't. Jerry boy, why do you have to paint everything so black? Oh, suppose you got hit by a truck. Suppose the stock market crashes. Suppose Mary Pickford divorces Douglas Fairbanks. Suppose the Dodgers leave Brooklyn. Joe? Suppose Lake Michigan overflows. Well, don't look now, but the whole town is underwater. One of the great things about film is how your stars are introduced. I think we've talked about this numerous times on the show, and to me, this is a great introduction. I absolutely agree. They don't have to say two words to each other. You see them playing. You get that they're friends. The fact that Jack Nicholson, oh, Jack uh, Lemon's body language is leaning into Tony Curtis, so you sense there's a there's a, a connection between them without them even speaking a word, and it's just great. And then boom, of course, we get to that point. Right into that sparkling dialogue for Billy Wilder, yeah. and you get their characters right away. Exactly. And, and, and I'm telling you, for screenwriters out there, if you want to learn to understand joke structure, <laughs> watch this movie. They just, it's set up joke, set up joke, set yep. up joke. They're all, they're all just perfectly framed. And by the way, there are a lot of movies we've talked about where actors did a lot of improv on the set. Not this one. No, I'm sure. You don't mess with Billy Wilder. Right. And, and the, the other uh, writer is I.L. Diamond, uh, who's the co-writer. And they and he was on the set all the time. And oh. they Billy Wilder felt his job was to film the script. Right. That was the job. Wow. Um, which is a... a it's a different way of looking at it. Yeah. That's not what Francis Ford Coppola is doing on Apocalypse Now. No. He's exploring his artistic whatever. Right, right. Billy Wilder's like, we're filming this script. That is what we're doing. <laughs> um, we spent a lot of time talking about Billy Wilder and Marilyn Monroe, so I only want to spend a little bit of time talking about Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon. Yeah. They are up-and-coming stars. Tony Curtis is the bigger star at of this the point, two. Right? Yeah, because he's just done The Defiant Ones. Right, he's, with Sidney uh, Poitier, yeah. With Sidney Poitier, which is a really good movie. A yeah, damn good movie. Yeah, really good movie. Uh, he's born Bernie Schwartz in Brooklyn. A uh, nice Jewish kid, served in the Navy during World War II. He was actually at the, the surrender of the Japanese. Wow. He was like right standing right there on a naval vessel wow. when that happened. Um, and kind of struggled along as a star in the late 40s and sort of hit it in the, in the 50s. Yep. Um, and Jack Lemmon, Jack Lemmon is one of my favorite actors of all mm. time. I think there are only, there are three people in history that I think are equally good at comedy and drama Ooh. as Jack Lemmon. Ooh. And they are Jimmy Stewart. Yes, I was going to say, you have to put that in there. And Tom Hanks. Wow. Yeah. Is that, okay. is that 
is that when we first met Tom Hanks, he was a great yes, comedian. absolutely. And that he went over and did some of the great dramas of all time. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, and Jack Lemmon is one of those guys. Yeah. Is that he is perfectly comfortable in either one. Yeah. He's a very well-trained actor, came out of the theater. And he's the, the smallest star. This is mm -hmm. the movie. He had just done Mr. Roberts. Right. And that and that he got an Academy Award nomination, and then this is the movie that really solidifies him as a star. Right, right. And yeah. then the apartment really blows him up. The next, apartment blows him up, and, and it has year. this real relationship with Billy Wilder yeah. for seven movies, I think. Yeah, yeah. Jack Lemmon is he's great. Yeah, don't uh, disagree with you at all. Oh, I have one more thing to say about Jack Lemmon, sure. which is that he always believed in Billy being really supportive. He said, "This is a quote from him." He said, "People who do well in the business have an obligation to send the elevator back down to people waiting on the ground floor." <laughs> That's a great. And, and an example of this is he went to, and I'm not sure what other circumstances were, to see a high school play. And one of the kids in the play was really good. And he went backstage to tell that kid, hey, you should follow a career in acting. And that's Kevin Spacey. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Isn't that great? Yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah. I mean, they are doing Glengarry Glen Ross years do, later. Yeah, they do. And they do Ice Man Cometh. They do all right. this stuff. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like, it's like that's, a, that's an amazing thing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. You got to love some Jack Lemmon. Yep. All right, so we got our two musicians. They're they're playing music and they're looking over. They look over at Pat O'Brien. Pulls out a badge. This might be some trouble. And just casually pulls out a badge yeah. to stab you know holes in his cigar to so get better you know to be able to suck it in better. And it's just like well, he's just casually pulling sure. out a badge. No big deal. Um, and they realize there's going to be a raid. They yep. start to hightail it out of there just as the cops come and raid the speakeasy. Yep. We get outside. Spats, <laughs> Spats Columbo is, is just has his, what he says are his Harvard lawyers, yeah. which are his big goons. He doesn't <laughs> seem really scared of this raid. Right. And we're outside. They're rounding up all the drunks and everybody else. And who's sneaking down the fire escape but our main characters Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis. Which will happen again later in the movie, which is an interesting bookend between the they two situations. They do a lot of sneaking out. They really do. <laughs> Those situations. Yeah. And, you know, they, we, we've kind of learned a little bit about their characters, that Tony Curtis is a little more aggressive, yeah. always want to make bets and gamble, and Jack Lemmon is more conservative. Right. And Tony Curtis always seems to get his way, though. Yeah, he does. Well, that's why he's friends with Jack Lemmon. But Jack Lemmon, <laughs> you know, you see these, uh, you may even have these friendships in your life or you may see people oh, who have yeah. these friendships in your life and you're just like, yeah, you just kind of like go along because there's there's something about the gambler personality that fills the holes into the person who's too conservative. It's just how yeah. it works. Like, you know, it's, a, it's, it's just, and yeah, the gambler usually gets his way. Down. Absolutely. Having been the, I'm much more the Jack Lemmon kind of guy. <laughs> there have been lots of times where I've been somewhere and go, how the fuck did I end up here? <laughs> Why am I doing this? Yep. But those some people just have that power. Yeah. And Tony Curtis certainly does. We have a great button on the scene where he says, I wonder how much Sam the bookie will give us for our overcoats. Sam the bookie? There's nothing doing. You're not going to put my overcoat on a dog. Oh, you, you, Jerry, I told you it's a sure thing. We will freeze. It is below zero. We'll get pneumonia. Look, stupid, he's 10 to 1. Tomorrow we'll have 20 overcoats. Joe. Cut to the middle of winter. They're very cold. Yes, and no overcoats. No overcoats. <laughs> um, and true to form, Tony tries to convince him to trade in their instruments yeah. on another dog after they just lost all their uh, all their money yeah. up from the overcoats. Yeah, It's great comic setup. Yep. And we're going to head up to the agency, and they go door to door trying to get some work. As you did back in the old days. <laughs> sure. Hey, look, if, if there was some building that you and I could go to to go door to door... <laughs> Who I mean, wouldn't you do? We would totally Cinefals. do it. Just hi. Is anything for me? No. Anything for me? No. Uh, and the, unfortunately, one of the secretaries seems to know Tony Curtis. Yeah. He stood her up for a date, and yet he still is kind of charming to well, her. Well, he's a charming guy. He's very charming. That some guys Curtis. just get away with it in the bubble, man. Some yeah. guys just get away with it. I've seen it many times in my life. Oh, it's true. Yeah, it's true. Definitely. Some guys just get away with it. There are people that we and you and I could both name yes. right now. Um, <laughs> So, um, but she's kind of a little irritated with him. She plays a little bit of a joke on him. Right. Well, it just so happens he is looking for a face and a sax. What's the job? Three weeks in Florida. Florida! At the Seminole Ritz in Miami. Transportation and expenses all paid. Isn't she a bit of terrific? And of course, we go into the room where they're talking about this, and we find out that it's an all-girls band. Right. But they don't know this yet. Not yet, no. And uh, they walk in and they push hard to get this job. Yeah. No, no. And again, you see the classic I.L. Diamond, Billy Wilder setup and payoff. Well, you need a bass and a sax, don't you? The instruments are right, but you're not. Huh? I want to speak to Mr. Morris. Wait a minute. What's wrong with us? You're in the wrong shape. Goodbye. 
You're wrong chief. What are you looking for? Hunchbacks or something? It's not the backs that worry me. Well, what kind of a band is it anyway? You gotta be under 25. We could pass for that. You gotta be blonde. We That's could dye our hair. And you gotta be girls. We could no, we couldn't. But it's so interesting because then uh, Jack Lemon is the one that's like, oh, well, let's do it. We can do this. We can borrow the clothes. Remember, we, we did a hula skirts, all this kind of stuff. And we get a real glimpse into Jack's manic comedy instincts. Yeah. Right? Which is, and you said, this is the stage where he's just about to build himself up into a star. And he is really given a lot of moments to expand his comedy and play. It's not slapstick. It's just exciting comedy he's like it's enthusiastic enthusiastic yes yeah. it's enthusiastic comedy which is when when a good master actor does it it's so much fun to watch well it never seems not real yep. it always seems like this is this person yep. who gets really excited and then really conservative yes. and then really excited <laughs> yeah, exactly and he's so fun to watch yeah but Tony's not having, we're not dressing up as women. That's right. a terrible, terrible idea. They get this other gig that sounds to pay like six bucks to yeah. drive 100 miles, which even in 1929 seems like, or 28 seems like a bad deal. Right. They figure out they're going to borrow the secretary's car. They go to the garage and they walk right into the St. Valentine's Day massacre. Yeah. I mean, which is a real, I mean, it, it's, it's an actual referencing event. a real event. Yeah. They, because Spats Columbo shows up wipes out Toothpick Charlie and all the other guys, and they witness the murder. And I thought they were, and, and you know what's great is they witness it, and they get caught witnessing it. Oh, which yeah. is a nice choice for the script, to have them not be constantly running away, afraid that they're going to be caught in a way that's like, well, they might have known we were there. This is more action-oriented. It's a great choice by this, uh, the script writer, by Billy Wilder and the script writers to do that. Well, and it's a key plot point. Yeah. Because now they, they someone knows their faces. Yes. They run away. And J Jack Lemon had been the person who said, let's go dress up as girls before. Tony rejected it, and now we reverse it. Yeah, well. And Tony said, calls up and uses his voice. Hello, Mr. Polyakov. I understand you're looking for a couple of girl musicians. Such a great female voice. Yeah. I by, love it. By the way, not all him. What? So apparently he struggled to get that tone right. Oh. And what he says is they brought in a voice actor to, and he says that some of it is him and some of it is not him. Wow. And we don't really know how much is him and not him. Is the voice actor a woman or a man? No, a man. Okay. Uh, but I don't know the name of the voice actor. I probably should have found that out. Okay. Um, cut to legs. Yeah. It's great. <laughs> they show up dressed in drag, walking down the, you know, in this train station. Yeah. I think they make pretty good looking women. Uh, good looking women? <laughs> Tony Curtis certainly makes Tony, a good looking woman. Jack Lemon, eh, maybe not, not so, so much. much. And then that speaks to the prettiness of certain uh, male actors. When they're they're actually pretty male actors, they can be women. They can pass as women and it's believable. When you see something like Jack Lemon or or Dustin Hoffman in Tootsie, like mm. you have to strain to accept it. But <laughs> if it's done really well, you can accept it. And I think the hat on Jack Lemon helps to accentuate all of that, which of course is a shout out to the costume designers and the people who coordinate this whole these whole look of both Josephine and Daphne slash Geraldine. Well, and this is this is first of all, there's something I can't confirm, oh. which is my gut is that this is why this movie's in black and white. Oh, Be because traditionally at this time yeah. comedies were in color, right? Black and white was for dramas, right? Um, but my guess is they went, you know, we got these guys in makeup. We can make them look a lot better in black and white. Color's, right. color's not going to help them out. Right. And they actually did weeks of makeup tests to try to get to this point. Right. And when they finally got to this point, Tony and Jack said, let's test it out. And they went to the ladies' room on the studio lot oh. and sat doing their makeup. And, and nobody noticed it. And they went, okay, we're good. <laughs> that, that, that they <laughs> made great. it. Ori Kelly's a very famous designer. Mm -hmm. And he's doing Marilyn's dresses. Right. And... Tony and Jack went to Billy Wilder and said, listen, why don't you have them make our dresses too? So those dresses are also designed by this famous costume designer. Right. Um, and so we see them walking. Immediately we get some good comedy of Jack stumbling and how do they walk this way? And it's a completely different sex. Yes, yes. And, so, and throughout the movie, we get this is the first sample we get of numerous interactions between them about the struggles that women have yeah. in this world, in a man's world and what they have to deal with day to day, which I don't know how much had been addressed in film up to this point in 1959. I, I think in this sense, this is a very feminist movie. Yes, you know, absolutely. Because it really does show that stuff. Yeah. I, and I agree with you. I can't think of other movies that kind of went into yeah. that those areas. Yeah, I'm sure there are some Betty Davis films where she has these strong statements or strong points, but this is more about like what it's like to be a woman practically in the world. Do you well, know what and I'm it, saying? It, to do it, you take a man and yeah. put them in that position yeah, and they right. go, oh shit, yeah. this seems really rough. Yeah, exactly. Um, and as they're walking, who blows by them but Marilyn Monroe? <sighs> My word. Yeah. I, I, I don't know how to put this. I'm just going to put it the straight sure, up way. Sure. 
there's a lot of sex appeal here. She's she's beautiful in ways that words don't even do justice. Like her sex appeal, her attraction, her energy, her essence is one of complete and utter just beauty. And I, like I said, I don't have the word for it. It's beyond beauty because you are aroused and you appreciate her as well for her face, her body, her voice. All of it is so incredibly gorgeous. But you also like want to sleep with her because she's so incredibly attractive. So it's like, yeah, I don't want to denigrate you and just want to sleep with you. I also appreciate like your entire energy, your entire essence as a woman, you know? So it's almost like this product to consume almost, you know what I'm saying? Cause you see her and you're just like, I don't know what to do. I'm blown away by this. Well, like, she, I'm in awe. You know? she, she is, I mean, I don't know what's happening. I'm yeah. a heterosexual man <laughs> and, and things are happening when I watch Marilyn, particularly That's in this right. movie and, and that are, it's not that she's not unbelievably beautiful. No. She is. Yes, yeah, she is. But there's a lot of women that are unbelievably beautiful sure. that do not have this effect. Marilyn somehow has to bottle something. Mm -hmm. There's there's a story, by the way, that a friend of mine told me that uh, that Marilyn is walking down the street with a friend. It might be Paula Strasberg, who's Lee Strasberg's wife, yeah. who is her acting coach. Right. And walking down with a friend in New York City, and nobody's paying any attention. And they're talking about like the Marilyn per persona. Yeah. And she and Marilyn basically says, "Do you want to see it?" Wow. And Paula says, "What are you talking about?" And Marilyn just is walking, and changes her posture, Ooh. her walk, or something, and suddenly New York turns to her. Wow! And that there's some mm -hmm. thing mm -hmm. that she and I don't know if this story is true, but I be, I kind of believe it. I would believe it a thousand percent. Yeah, yeah. The, the, there's something about her that just you cannot take your eyes off. Yeah, her. absolutely. Um, and that also gets into some of the things we talk about that maybe are problematic about her, mm. you know, in real life and yeah, who she sure. is and all this other stuff. Uh, so we meet Marilyn. She goes walking by. There's a blast of steam that comes <laughs> off of the train, <laughs> right. which is Billy Wilder's reference to the most famous moment of all time in his previous movie with right. her seven year itch, yes. which is her over the subway grate. Mm -hmm. uh, we meet uh, the band leader. We introduce ourselves as Josephine and Daphne. Yeah. Uh, we get on the train and... Jack Levin is very excited. Yes, he is. <laughs> Literally a kid in the candy shop. Literally a horn dog. Yes. Yeah. He is thrilled to be here. Right. <laughs> and I love the Tony Curtis settling him down. Like, you're not here to sample the pastries. <laughs> you're a girl. And Jack Levin's, I'm a girl. I'm, I'm a girl. girl. I'm a girl. And what's great is this is the difference. And this is a really small thing. But this is between someone who can get a woman anytime he wants. Tony Curtis versus a man who's like, oh, if I have a lot of options, I might have a chance. Right. Right. There's the Tony Curtis is like, just chill out, relax. And the other one's like bopping off, going crazy yes. inside a cage. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's, so, <laughs> it's so much fun to watch yes. Jack Lemmon in this movie. Agreed. It's just a joy. Um, we have a little more talk with uh, uh, Sugar, who yes. is Marilyn Monroe's character's name. We see that she uh, likes the bourbon. Yes. We go out to have our first rehearsal on the mm -hmm. train and you see Marilyn Monroe sing and you know, it's the same thing. Marilyn Monroe is not the best singer in the world. Right. But there's something about her. Yeah. And both Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon really aware of that yeah. in this scene. Yeah. And, and you see them, it builds from that first scene where they're talking with her up until this moment yeah. when they're watching her and while they're doing what she's shaking and singing and doing whatever. And, and then the, then the uh, uh, flask falls out. That's right. Yeah. And Marilyn has told us, Sugar has told us that yeah. uh, one more drinking incident, she's going to get kicked out of the band. Right. And who comes to her rescue? Jack Lemon. Jack Lemon. Yeah. Oh, it's oh, it's oh, that's mine. Can I? Thanks for holding yeah. that for me. Yeah. <laughs> it's a very smooth move. But this is and this is what's uh, great about these Billy Wilder films. They are they are littered with these great actors who play these smaller parts and really flesh out those scenes. You know, and you have uh, with the the person who runs the band, yeah, right? Sue. Sue. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sweet Sue. And then you have uh, the Beanstalk. So Sweet Sue right. and Beanstalk are the back and forth. It's just almost a comedy team themselves. Yep. You know what I'm saying? Almost Comden and Green, you could maybe say, in the way that that's come out. And, and you see the way they play off each other. And it's great. And Sweet Sue does the brassy. She's almost the Eve Arden from Grease type of yeah, totally. vibe. You know what I'm saying? And what's great also about these girls is the first thing they say once they, they lie about being the conservatory when they're about to go onto the train, uh, Geraldine and, 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 and Daphne, uh, or Josephine rather, and Daphne, the sweet Sue says, well, we got to get the girls to watch their language. And that lets you know something. And this is the truth. Male or female, when you're a performer, it is not yep. for the faint of heart. And there is a lot of rough conversations, rough behavior. 
per- performing is not some kind of beautiful thing where everyone's like taking in these having these very intelligent layered conversations. Well, they might have lofty. those too. Yeah, sure, at some point. But there's the <laughs> but base peppered in with a lot of other. <laughs> of course, because yeah. you're around these people and you have to undress in front of these people all the time. Yeah. You have to have these kind of interactions. You have to performing for other people who might be rude or might be appreciative of what you're doing. So it just naturally fosters that kind of mentality. So I love the fact that they they didn't present these girls as like these little sweet little dainty class manner girls. They are performers. Well, you know? it's, and it's 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 such a great point you make because Jack and Tony present themselves yes. as, oh, we're from the conservatory yeah. because their assumption is that behind the scenes, all these girls are going to be elegant yes. and sophisticated and that <laughs> they realize really fast that is not the case right. and that is awesome. Yeah. Which brings us, of course, to it's bedtime. Yeah. We're, all, we're all getting into our compartments. Uh, Tony is reminding Jack, I'm a girl, I'm a, you're a girl, yeah. you're a girl, you're a girl. And Jack is lying in bed and who should pop up into his compartment <laughs> but sugar? There's ever anything I can do for you. I can think of a million things. That's one of them. Shh. Sweet Sue. Mm-hmm. Maybe I better stay here till she goes back to sleep. You stay here as long as you like. I'm not crowding you, am I? No, oh, it's nice and cozy. <laughs> what a great back and forth between these two. In that moment, right? She climbs the scene in. scene is magical. Yeah, it really is. From him hitting his head when he wakes up to them having the conversation about she's like, I, I, anything you need. And he's like, I think I can think of a thousand things. Yeah. Then she climbs in and he goes, that's one of them. And yeah. it's just, just brilliant. It's so funny. Yeah. It's so sexy. Mm-hmm. It's so tight. The performances are so good. Yeah. It is, it is, a, it is an amazing little scene. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's great. And of course, what does Sugar want? She, she wants to have a drink. Yep. <laughs> and fortunately, Jack Lemon knows where he can find some drinks. And find some whiskey. Yeah. And Jack is doing this because he says, I got a surprise for you, which is basically inferring he is going to reveal that he's a man to her. Oh yeah. He cannot he cannot hold himself back. He's obviously has no control. Well, he's, could you? Yes, I know I couldn't. No, I mean, not with Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn, no, no. Yeah, if I'm lying in bed and yeah. Marilyn Monroe call, crawls into my bed yeah, yeah, yeah. and is snuggling with yeah, me. Yeah, it's really tough. That's really tough. And what's great is they don't make any allusions to him like having a heart on or get like they don't play that note, which they don't have to. Right. Right? Her him her rubbing his feet. Him like, I'm a girl, I'm a girl, I'm a girl. Like, all of that is brilliant because you we, get what he's we, trying to do. We get what's happening. Exactly. You don't <laughs> have to very infer. very clear. I mean, you don't have to hit it on the head. And of course, as soon as we get this booze, we realize somebody else has uh, some vermouth. Yeah. We could be making Manhattans and yeah. now we've got a party. Now we've got a party. Man, I like this Cheese band. and crackers. All the, yeah, this is a great band, right? And apparently Sweet Sue is a very sound sleeper. Very sound. Be- and 13 <laughs> people climbed into that <laughs> overhead. That's amazing. And it's beautifully shot. like Because yeah. that, that's not easy to get all those heads in just the right place. You right. can see them with camera. Yeah. And uh, now it's time for Tony Curtis to wake up. Yeah. And we go off to get ice and we get Josephine, Tony Curtis's character, having a real nice heart to heart with Sugar. What's the matter with you anyway? I'm not very bright, I guess. I wouldn't say that. Careless, maybe. No, just dumb. If I had any brains, it wouldn't be on this crummy train with this crummy girl's band. Well, why'd you take this job? I used to sing with male bands, but I can't afford it anymore. Have you ever been with a male band? Who? Me? That's what I'm running away from. I worked with six different ones the last two years. Oh, brother. Rob? I'll say. You can't trust those guys. I can't trust myself. I have this thing about saxophone players, especially tenor sax. Really? I don't know what it is, but they just curdle me. All they have to do is play eight bars or come to me, my melancholy baby, and my spine turns to custard. I get goose pimply all over, and I come to them. That's all? Every time. And that's when the idea comes to Tony about what he's going to do later on in the film. And that she's like, why she's going to Florida is to meet a, a rich guy who has a yacht, blah, blah, blah. She's basically laying the parameters of the guy and man that she wants to be with. You know, and so you see that come up. Absolutely. It's it's very, very clear. And yeah. Tony figures it out. And, and I think this is Marilyn at her best, by the way, this yeah. scene. I oh, think yeah. in terms of acting, she's... She's just great. I agree. and But I also think the scene with her and Lemon is fantastic in that oh, yeah. that's a scene that if you're, a, if you're an actress just known for your TNA or your looks, you will be transparent in a scene like that. Your limited abilities. Marilyn is a good actress. That, that comedic timing, the back and forth, the not betraying the different changing in moment, moments between her and Jack as the conversation progresses is really amazing. And all the more so when we see her with Tony Curtis. Even more of her ability comes through when you see yeah. that scene. So I agree with you, man. Absolutely. She's great. 
uh, uh, Jack Lemmon's now getting tickled. Right. And finally, in the midst of the tickling, to end this scene, pulls down on the emergency brake, which had been planted twice before. Yes. Because everything is well constructed in this yep. movie. Uh, we end up in Florida. Yes. Um, there we, as, as and, and at this moment, we see the competition for Maryland. Yes. This is where it really starts. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, Tony is moving in and really Jack does not have a lot of game. <laughs> <laughs> Even against Tony as a woman. It's it's tough to beat Tony Curtis. Man. <laughs> but, we, but we're introduced also to Joey Brown as they walk in with the instruments. Joey Brown is mm -hmm. there to help uh, uh, Daphne. I'm Osgood Fielding the third. Cinderella the second. If there's one thing I admire, it's a girl with a shapely ankle. <laughs> Me too. Bye-bye. And we get another moment where what a woman has to deal with. Absolutely. The, the old guy is so fresh. He follows her into the elevator and attempts to try to, to make out with her yeah. or something. And uh, the elevator, a great little bit with the elevator stopping in the middle and going all the way back down. And then her slapping him and telling him, I don't know what kind of girl you think I am. And her storming. He goes, give me another. Day. He says something like, she says, I'll walk. You know, like that. It's just a very, and this is lets you know, you know, and it's played for comedy because he's Absolutely. turned and he's laughing about being slapped in the face. He kind of likes it. Yeah, but he likes it. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, let's, yeah. yeah. I mean, so it is, it definitely shows that side of it. Yeah. And this is Joey Brown, who's a longtime character actor. Yeah. He's got one of the best names in any movie I can yes. think of. Osgood Fielding the <laughs> third. That is a great, great yeah. name. <laughs> Names are important in comedy, man. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. We get uh, back up to the room. Uh, Jack Lemon is pissed off because he's just felt what it was like to be a woman under yeah. these circumstances. Yeah. Uh, but uh, Tony Curtis is playing his own game. But isn't this where Tony gets uh, kind of harassed by the bellhop oh, as yeah, well? The bellhop. Yeah. So they both... By the way, the bellhop is horrible. Oh, what do you mean as a person? Yes. Yeah, but as an actor, the kid oh, is fantastic. Oh, great, great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah, of course he's horrible. But 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 they both experiencing their versions of harassment. Absolutely, you know? no question uh, about it. Tony is like the the kid is like uh yeah he's at least too young to be hitting on her like that. And then when she pushes him away, or when Tony pushes him away, he says, "I like him like that, big and brassy or big and bold." Yeah, and you're just like holy shit. Well, at one point this bell help says something like. I've got the key to your room. Yeah. I'll be, it's like, holy shit. Yeah. And then he says, get rid of the roommate. Yeah. It demands this punk kid of it's a woman. Uh, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> of a quote unquote now, yeah. woman. <laughs> and Jack's ready to well, go. In his mind, it's a woman. <laughs> and Jack's ready to go. He's out. He's like, we got to Florida. Let's yeah. get the hell out. Tony wants to stay. Hmm. And then in comes Sugar. Let's go to the beach. And Jack's all about going to the beach. Oh, yeah, he is. Uh, to Tony doesn't really want to go with him. We'll find out why momentarily. Yeah. Because he swiped a suitcase and he's trying on a new outfit. Yes. Has glasses. Which just happens to fit. Yeah, just And those two guys do not look like they're the same size at all. <laughs> um, and so we have Jack playing with Sugar in the beach. Uh, again, Marilyn looks good in that bathing suit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but this is an interest. This is the beginning. Uh, this is Steve. This is an interesting conversation to have because this movie. I hope it's an interesting conversation. Well, <laughs> We've got people tuning in. This movie, Jack is basically, and I know this term is like angers uh, women now in 2017. But Jack is basically friend zoned from the beginning. As a woman, as yes. a woman, yeah, yes. she's friend zoned as a woman, and even as a pers perspective. Uh, suitor to us in the audience, knowing that this is a man, right. he's being friend zoned. Tony negs her which is what the term is right we've both read the game that book. i have not read the oh, you've read the game things one of the things they say about picking up women is sometimes uh you have to be uh like dismissive of them and not 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 right. not not be like all about them and all over them from the beginning now some women don't like that obviously and some women do like that and so marilyn responds to him like tripping he's physically assaults her essentially by tripping her to get her attention and then he's aloof about her and he's like uh go away you're blocking my yacht you're blocking the flag you do blah 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 he does all this stuff and he keeps going back to his paper but she keeps insisting on trying to talk to him because he's ignoring her and these are tactics right and it's Absolutely. fascinating to watch the different tactics with jack lemon wanting to do everything possible to make her happy and tony curtis is doing everything possible to ignore her and it works when you're an attractive guy. Uh, that's what I was just going to say. Um, <laughs> that's what I'm getting at. Because that... Tony's so attractive, it fucking works. Because when an ugly guy <laughs> yeah. says, stay out of my way, yeah. they go, okay. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Why also, are you even talking to me? <laughs> but by the way, I'm so glad you did it because Tony Grant, Tony Grant, Tony Curtis does this <laughs> Cary Grant impression. Oh, yeah. Very good. That impression. is so good and bad yes if that makes sense yeah it is so much tony curtis pretending to be Cary grant <laughs> yes exactly tell me who runs up that flag your wife no my flag's to it 
Who mixes the cocktails? Your wife? No, my cocktails do it. Look, if you're interested in whether I am married or not... Oh, I'm not interested at all. Well, I'm not. That's very interesting. And right in this scene, they're immediately... What's interesting about it is Tony Curtis is obviously lying and manipulating yes, her. Yes. She's lying, too. Yes, of course she is. She's making up some story. You're right. Um, um, she's high and high, high society, yeah. something. That's what she wants to appeal to him. Yeah. Syncopators. Does that mean you play that very fast music, uh, jazz? Yeah, real hot. <laughs> oh, well, I guess some like it hot. I personally prefer classical music. Oh, I do, too. As a matter of fact, I spent three years at the Sheboygan Conservatory of Music. Good school. And your family doesn't object to your career. They do, indeed. Daddy threatened to cut me off without a cent. But I don't care. It was such a bore, you know, coming out parties. Inauguration ball. Opening of the opera. Riding to hound. You know, it's amazing we never ran into each other before. I'm sure I would have remembered anybody as attractive as you are. Hey, just as this conversation is finishing up, who walks up with Jack Lemon? <laughs> Not pleased. And of course, he can't out Tony without nope. outing himself. Nope. It's a very complicated situation. But a very great back and forth uh, with the, the uh, roommate being strangled yes. by the brazier. Yes. <laughs> just great stuff. Jack and Sugar go back to the room. And Run he, back to the room. Yes. And yeah. who do they find there? But Josephine, Josephine in the bath. Yeah. And she's just taking her path. Sugar leaves, and I love... And Jack Lemon is pissed off. Yeah, he's mad. I love the shot of Tony Curtis getting out of the bath. Slowly. Slowly, <laughs> wearing the sailor yeah. captain's outfit. It is hilarious. Yeah, and then approaching him. And, of course, Jack Lemon trying to, to uh, uh, fight him back, uh, fight him off in vain verbally, and then getting like grabbed by Tony Curtis, which is great. Yeah, and at this point, yeah. Jack Lemon crumbles. And what's... yes. Interesting about the movie is he stays crumbled yeah. for the whole movie. Yeah. He has completely abdicated any abdicated any chance he has yeah. with sugar. He's like, okay, I'm just going to do whatever you say from now on. Which we've built that relationship up from the beginning. Yeah. Well, now we never saw how he actually yeah. convinced him to to hawk the overcoats. Right. But but now we you know it's like oh know. yeah, Jack Lemmon's always going to crumble. Right. Right. That's too bad. I love him. Well, he's supposed to. It serves the movie. Yeah. And Tony's a better love story with. Marilyn uh, with the Marilyn Monroe character than, than and, Jack Lemmon would be. Yes, yes, absolutely. I think Marilyn Monroe. I think the Marilyn Monroe character in ten years, Jack Lemmon is perfect for her. I think at this stage in her life, Tony Curtis right. is perfect for her. Well, if we're in if we're in the seven year itch, then the Jack Lemmon character is that, that's, absolutely. But this is that's not the movie we're Great in. Great point. We're yeah. in this movie. Yep. Um, and uh, just as we're having this conversation, we get a ship to shore call. <laughs> it's our good friend Osgood, Osgood <laughs> and he wants to make a date. Uh, with uh, Jack Lemon or yeah. with Daphne. Daphne and Tony insists that they make that date mm -hmm. Tony is he's got a plan man <laughs> he comes up with his plan really fast yeah yeah he's a dangerous person as I soon think. as he says he has a yacht he's like oh he's got this plan real all set up it's all worked out yep yep we go to the club we yeah. have a big musical number the costuming on Marilyn Monroe throughout mm. this film and it was very controversial at the time. Oh, was it? Oh, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, is so revealing. Yeah, it always is always giving you the impression that is she naked? Like, what am I seeing? Oh, good point. The way things are lit, like uh -huh. the sheer skin colored. Yeah, you know where it's always very, very revealing, form fitting. Mm -hmm. I mean, again, it's pushing this image, this yeah. sexy image. Yeah, and we have this great setup where. He takes the flowers that Osgood sent to Jack Lemon and he gives them to Sugar. Yeah. He's manipulating this whole situation. He has uh, uh, Jack take Osgood, say, I don't want to go to the yacht, and that frees it up for yeah. Tony Curtis's character. Do we ever know what his name is? What his fake name is? Well, he's Shell Jr. Shell Jr., yeah. yeah. So <laughs> Shell Jr. <laughs> for to, the Shell life. To get on the boat and take take uh, Sugar off to the yacht. Yeah. <laughs> the, the game that he plays on her in the yacht is yeah. crazy. I mean, but once again, if you're a good looking guy with money, you can get away with that, I think, a little bit by being like, all these doctors have tried to, you know, kind of figure out why I, I women just turn me cold. It's just a brilliant thing to play. And Marilyn, and some people might argue, oh, He's like manipulating her, blah, blah, blah. but there's still power in what Marilyn is doing. She's making the choice. She's not. She's playing along with the game, and I think there's a strength in that, in my opinion. As I watch the film, I don't think she's being like abused in any way, shape, or form. And I, she's also she's also been lying to him too. So they're on an evil play, even playing field in a way. I, I don't think it's even. 
I do okay. think she's definitely if if she hadn't been lying to him as well, yeah, then there's no question that this is abuse, right? You know, he is completely manipulating, yes. you know, lying together for sex only with no, you know, he's pretending to be someone else in order right. to fuck this woman, you know. But because she's also lying to him, it, it mitigates that a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, the, but the advantage is you're right. Actually, you're right, Steve, because the advantage is Tony knows she's lying to him, right? So that's the good point. That's a good point. Yeah, I hadn't it, thought of but, that. Okay. but it is. It is a little complicated. First of all, I want to yeah. say about the scene, one of the great things is that you have two characters who are lying. They're lying stupidly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Each one knows that they are lying and therefore isn't ca- isn't like neither of them are worrying about the stupid things the <laughs> yeah, other one says right. because they don't care because they're all going they're both going after their goal. Right. It's a really really funny scene. Yes. Um like it, there's the whole thing she points to like a marlin. What is that? Oh, that's a herring. How do they get them into the little cans? <laughs> uh, they shrink when you marinate them. <laughs> It's just great joke yeah. setup payoff. Yeah. Look at all that silverware. Uh, trophies. You know, skeet shooting, dog breeding, water polo. Water polo, isn't that terribly dangerous? I'll say I had two ponies drowned under me. Where's your hair collection? Mm. Yes, of course. Now, where could they have put it? You see, on Thursdays, I'm sort of lost around here. What's on Thursday? It's the cruise night off. You mean we're alone on the boat? Completely. You know, I've never been completely alone with a man before in the middle of the night, in the middle of the ocean. Oh, it's perfectly safe. We're well anchored. Ships in ship shape shape. And the Coast Guard promised to call me if there were any icebergs around. It's not the icebergs, but there are certain men who would try to take advantage of a situation like this. You're flattering me. Of course, I'm sure you're a gentleman. Oh, it's not that. It's uh, just that I'm um, harmless. Harmless? How? Well, I don't know how to put it, but I've got this thing about girls. What thing? They just sort of leave me cold. You mean like frigid? Well, it's more like um, a mental block. When I'm with a girl, it does absolutely nothing to me. Have you tried? Have I? I'm trying all the time. Um, but the one thing I would say is that, and this is a weird side, I'm watching it with my wife, yeah. and when we get to the points that you mentioned with the pinch and the walking in heels, yeah. Karen and I both go, yeah, this is really a feminist movie. Mm-hmm. And then she said something at the end, which I've thought about a lot, which she said, in some senses it is, but the character of Marilyn mm-hmm. is the male fantasy constructed sex pot. Sure. And that she is self-proclaimed not bright. Mm-hmm obsessed and uncontrollably attracted to saxophone players. Mm -hmm. She doesn't have a lot of self-respect. She throws herself at men Mm -hmm. and then doesn't, isn't angry really, you know, it's like she's the ultimate sort of weak female sex fantasy is what she's presenting. And that is sort of, I won't say, uh, it's a great movie and it is what it is, but like it's sort of this character yeah, of uh, the Marilyn character in a 2017 sort of more feminist world, it's like, oh, there's some trouble here. Yeah, and this may be, and I get her point. And Karen is obviously, you know, it's a, a correct analysis for Karen, right? This is how she sees it. So I get that, and I can understand her point of view. I think for me, I never once think that she's not in control of what she's doing. That she's not, hmm. she doesn't know what she's doing, what she's trying to do. Because she's also manipulating the situation to get yeah. with a guy who's rich, right? Right, Absolutely. who's a billionaire. So to me, that undercuts a little bit of this whole idea of like, well, she's a sex pot fan. I get it that she's, yeah, I get how you can get that. And watching it with 2017 eyes, it's very clear that you can come up with that. Absolutely. Um, because she is like, she's, you know, she drinks. She's always on the verge of ruining her life. She throws herself like at the saxophone players. Absolutely. But... There's also a sweetness and a vulnerability and an Absolutely. innocence Absolutely. No, her. that's part of the whole thing. Yeah, that doesn't make you feel sorry for her in a way that's like pity. It makes you feel sorry that you you want things to work out for her. There's a difference, right? I don't, I don't pity her condition. I cheer for her. I hope for her. I want her to achieve happiness. When and I, and you, you have her sadness when she sings the song after Tony has, which Absolutely. we'll get to later. That's a powerful thing. Yeah. What she's doing as an actress. Well, I think may, maybe a way to put it is that it's not so much what it's about her, but maybe what it says about men, you know, is that mm. what is what is it that we are attracted to? Right. And one thing, as I've said, that yeah. she is really attractive. Yes, absolutely. Is that it's not strength and intelligence and, you know, self-determination mm-hmm. and independence and all those things. It is 
vulnerability and neediness and mm -hmm. childlikeness and sexuality and the body and yeah. all of those things. And it's like the, you know, so in some ways we could say, oh, this is what it says about her. Right. And then it also maybe is something that it says about us. Yeah, yeah, but look at Jack Lemon as a woman. Jack Lemon as a woman is completely. I would rather opposite. look at Marilyn Monroe well, as a woman. Well, yeah, so would we all? But <laughs> Jack Lemon as a woman is the complete opposite. She's, Absolutely, he's very determined to like stand his ground and slap Joey Brown. And although he's playful with him, he never gives ground. Well, he has to chase him. Or like Joey but, Brown chases him. But it, which brings us as a perfect yes, segue to where we are in the film. That's right. Because intercut with this very <laughs> sexy scene in the yacht yeah. is our date with uh, Daphne and Osgood, oh, so which is hilarious. Yeah. And it's and this is what's sort of weird about the movie is we go from him slapping this guy's face and being indignant yeah. to he's having a ball. Yeah. He's having so much fun on the date. Right. He, they literally dance all night. Yeah. It's, it's, it, it, this is where you go, and again, this is 2017 eyes versus 1959 eyes, yeah. but how are we supposed to take this? <laughs> you know? <laughs> right. What, what is this saying about him? Well, but, but my feeling, from what I've read about Billy Wilder and heard it, he's not really trying to say anything. He's right. trying to write a, make a funny movie. Exactly. And, this and it is, is funny. funny. And it is funny. And, but also, it fits, Jack, it fits Jack Lemmon's character throughout the whole movie. Someone with a stronger personality can convince him to do just about anything. Well, and he's enthusiastic. And enthusiastic about he it when he's convinced to do it, yes. Just because Jack Lemmon is having fun. He yes. likes to have fun. He is. Tony Curtis isn't having fun. I mean, I'm sure Sleeping with Marilyn Monroe was fun. Sure. Although, have you heard about what he said? Did about he sleep it? with her in the movie? Does he? Do you? Is that inferred? I feel that they had sex yeah? that night. Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. I don't know. Here's my. I feel they my, just made out, but my, maybe. My general feeling is that if a movie has people making out and you fade to black, they yeah. had sex. Oh. Okay. <laughs> but I, I don't know. We have to do some analysis. Yeah, of this. we'd have to look at that. If we cut away and they're in a room. Yeah. You know. And, okay. And 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 then the next thing we see is it's the next morning. Right. They spent the night together. Well, that's. Oh, because they're uh, okay. Were, did they wake up together the next morning? I thought they were both like went back to sleep in their own respective houses. They come back at dawn in oh, the boat. Oh, that's right. Because it's dawn when the party ends with okay. Osgood and Daphne, okay. uh, where the band members are blindfolded yeah, by yeah, the yeah, end, yeah. which is Some a weird stuff. strange moment. Um, okay. So, so yeah, I, I, I feel that they did. That's fair. Okay. So, what Tony Curtis said about Marilyn Monroe. Oh, yeah. Um, so they were in uh, dailies watching, I think, this scene. And Tony's there and Jack is there. Paula Strasberg, who is Marilyn's acting coach, is yeah. there. Marilyn is not there. And someone asked Tony, what's it like kissing Marilyn Monroe? And he said, it's like kissing Hitler. Whoa. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Tony says that that was a joke. Like, like what is the most opposite thing he could oh, say right. of what it's actually like? I could get that, yeah. And but then also there's reasons to believe why people were not such a fan of Marilyn Monroe during the making of this movie. Oh. Also, it's Tony says, as do a lot of people, that he actually did have sex with Marilyn Monroe. Wow. At this time, yeah. There are a lot of people who say this. Hmm. Elliot Kazan, who did have a relationship with her in the early fifties, yeah. said that he had sex with her the night before she married DiMaggio. Wow. In his book. Now, I don't know if that's true. Ellie Kazan was a player. I mean, he was like a serious, yeah. had, he was like a serial affair haver. Wow. You know, he, he you know, however we want to take that. And what, whether or not his stories are true or not, I don't know. Hmm. But that's what he says. The dirty business. <laughs> it is. All right. So uh, we get back Jesus. and uh, Tony gets back from his night with Marilyn. Yeah. Jack gets back from his night with Osgood. Enthusiastically? He is thrilled. Yes. <laughs> I'm engaged. Congratulations. Who's the lucky girl? I am. <laughs> what? Osgood proposed to me. We're planning a June wedding. <laughs> what are you talking about? You can't marry Osgood. You think he's too old for me? Jerry, you can't be serious. Why not? He keeps marrying girls all the time. I, uh, but, I, uh, but you're not a girl, you're a guy. And why would a guy want to marry a guy? Security. Uh, uh, Jerry, you better lie down. You're not well. Will you stop treating me like a child? I'm not stupid. I know there's a problem. I'll say there is. His mother. We need her approval. But I'm not worried because I don't smoke. Uh -huh. I'm Jerry, there's another problem. Like what? Like what are you going to do on your honeymoon? We've been discussing that. 
He wants to go to the Riviera, but I kind of lean towards Niagara Falls. <laughs> yeah, the, the reason, by the way, for the maracas, and this is what Billy Wilder wanted him to do, one thing that happens when you see a comedy in a movie theater is a funny line happens, and then everybody laughs. Right. And if the timing is wrong in the movie, then everyone laughs over the next funny oh, line. Oh, yeah, of course. So he gave him the maracas as holds for laughter. Oh, that's smart. And it was hard for Jack Lemmon to figure out, to get the timing right, right. on how to do it. It took a lot of practice. I'm sure. It's a, and Jack Lemmon is, like, ready to get married. Jerry, Jerry, hold on. Jerry, Jerry, listen to me. Listen to me. There are laws, conventions. It's just not being done. Shh, Joe. This may be my last chance to marry a millionaire. And and the interaction with her, him and Tony Curtis is so great because like because then he reverses what he'd been telling him throughout the first half of the movie. He goes, "Just remember, you're a boy." Jerry, huh? Jerry, will you take my advice? Forget about the whole thing, will you? Just keep telling yourself you're a boy. You're a boy. I'm a boy. That's the boy. Oh, I'm a boy. I'm, I'm a boy. I'm a, I wish I were dead. I'm a boy. I'm a boy. Oh boy, am I a boy? And again, you go like, how am I supposed to take this about Jack Lemmon? And the answer, I think, is it's just funny. It's just funny, yeah. Yeah. Because Jack Lemmon is so caught up in the idea of being engaged. And he has his own plan because he's like, well, then he'll get it annulled. Then he'll give me a nice little settlement. I'll live off the alimony. Like he has his whole plan set out himself. So that's that's part of what his excitement is as well. Absolutely. Well, because his whole life he's been missing security. Yeah. I want security, you know. And this is a way to get it. Mm, Interesting. Yes, go ahead. Um. (laughs) <laughs> the, uh, so so then we get who shows up but sugar the line is it's me sugar yeah we have to talk about this for a moment okay because this is the this is the trouble with Marilyn that scene took 80 takes one line it's me sugar wow 80 takes Marilyn is not easy on your movie no particularly at this time in her life mm-hmm. she would show up three or four hours late <sighs> saying, oh, I got lost on the way to the studio. Uh, she rarely knew her lines. She was content. So Paul, so she had gone to the actor's studio in mm-hmm. the mid-50s, yeah, with studied with Lee yeah. Strasberg. Yeah. Paul Strasberg's Lee Strasberg's wife. She right. is on the set. After every take, she doesn't look to Billy Wilder, the director. She looks to Paul Strasberg, yeah. which is does happen on, you know, on movie sets. Mm-hmm. Um, I, as a director, have issues with it. You know, you've had that happen with you. I have, yeah. You've had acting coaches on set. Not on set. I had an actor once uh, who was on the phone between takes, calling his acting. Fuck off. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. On a on a short, I did. Um, I would fire that actor in a heartbeat. (laughs) Well, (laughs) I'm the director, shithead. Well, but get off my movie. Well, Billy Wilder didn't fire. You know, couldn't get rid of Paula Strasberg. No, because Strasberg is a strong name. That's that's real tough. Well, and it's Maryland. Yeah, it's Maryland. Maryland. Right, right, right. And and so, and, and what he told. What Wilder told Dude. Tony Curtis and Jack Lemmon, he said, you guys have to be perfect every time. Oh, shit. Because when Marilyn is good, that's the take we're using. Oh, my God. And they did. And <laughs> so, pressure. Yeah. And, so, and this is literally 80 takes to do this one line. Wow. And she's in tears. And she's insecure. And she runs yeah. off to her dressing room. Right, and right. he's trying to talk her down. The and original Paul, you know, diva. Yes. Yeah. I mean, it's just. And she's dealing with. We have to say that 1959 is not a good year for her. Right. Her, her marriage with Arthur Miller is breaking up. Mm-hmm. She's lost two babies. She's been pregnant twice and lost oh, two babies. Wow. She'd been pregnant really right before they started shooting this. Wow. Um, she's, and she, this is when her uh, alcohol and drug addiction is really kind of starting. And, yeah. and all of those insecurities and fragility and emotional stuff, along with right. maybe some diva stuff too, is hitting the head. And I'm sure she's been seeing Kennedy on the side too, because at this point, you know, Kennedy come, becomes president the next year and she yeah. does that happy birthday thing. So, she wasn't like she just started seeing Kennedy at like January of 1960. I, I, I'm I don't sure know when she, she was seeing him seeing as a candidate. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. I have no idea when she started seeing I'll him. I'll put money on it. Okay. Um, but she's going through a lot. Yeah. And this movie is going way over budget. Yeah. Because they just, cause, all because of Marilyn. It's not like it's a complicated movie. Right. Simple movie. Uh, even, and even they, so they wrote, it's me, sugar on the door. <laughs> and she couldn't get it right. And later on, scene where she's looking for her bourbon, yeah. they wrote the lines in all the drawers of the piece of furniture. So whatever drawer she opened up, yeah. her lines would be there. She went to the wrong piece of furniture. <laughs> you know? And, Jeez. And, and, and I'll tell you, here's what, here's what Billy Wilder said shortly after making this movie about Marilyn. He said, she has breasts like granite, she defies gravity, and has a brain-like Swiss cheese full of holes. I've discussed this with my doctor and my psychiatrist, and they tell me I'm too old, too rich to go through this again. That's what he said at the time. Here's what he said a little later. 
I had no problem with Marilyn Monroe. Monroe had problems with Monroe. When it was all done and my stomach got back to normal, it seemed well worth the agony of working with her. <laughs> and, and this is, seems to be what they all said. Yeah. Is, is that it was brutal. You yeah. know, in a way, it's a strange analogy. It's horrible. I'm going to say it anyway, yeah. which is you could compare it to Jaws and the shark doesn't work. <laughs> you know, is that in the end, the movie is great. Yeah. And that's all anybody cares yep. about. Yep. But during the process, it was horrible. And I'm sure there are a number of male actors who are just as difficult to of deal course. with at this time through decades in Hollywood as well. Of course. Issues coming in late, demanding certain things. I mean, this whole idea of the diva being just only female is uh, to me is something I really rail against or push back against because I've heard so many stories about male uh, Brando being one of them. Absolutely. Brando was a monster asshole. Well, we talked about time. an apocalypse now. Yeah. Yeah. I but mean, not even when he was younger, he was yeah. a monster asshole. I read his biography, a couple of his biographies, a monster asshole. So it was like, there's a lumber of, they take liberties, you know, well, in saying? general, fame is not healthy. No, no. And you especially know. if you're, a, if you're unstable and you've experienced so many things and you right. don't have that normal stability of an upbringing that is calm, it can be very, very difficult. You know, as you said, she was foster homes, married early, sexually abused. These all factor in losing yeah. children, pregnancies rather. These are all factored in in these situations. You know. Well, and and we don't get to know the path to making a great movie is never simple. No, you know, right? There's, you're going to go over all sorts of obstacles, and this is one of them. Yeah. Could you could you go that man? It would have been a lot easier to make this movie without Marilyn. Absolutely. Yeah. Would have been good. It might not have been as good. I mean, originally, here was the cast they had originally gone for. Ooh. Was Tony Curtis. Yes. Frank Sinatra. Ooh. And Mitzi Gaynor. Oh, Mitzi's great. I love Mitzi. Sure. I saw The Joker is Wild. I think it's one of her best performances with Frank. She ain't Marilyn. She ain't Marilyn. And Mitzi's still kicking. Mitzi's still performing. Yeah. She's amazing. I follow her on Facebook. Oh, really? I, I love her to death. Yes, I love her to death. She, I had such a crush on her, like watching her films. I have such an attraction for her. Yeah. But she ain't Marilyn. No. Oh. Well, and honestly, Frank ain't Jack Lemmon. Man, Frank ain't Jack Lemmon, right? Look, I love Frank Sinatra. Yeah, Frank ain't known for his comedy, yeah. necessarily. Yeah. <laughs> well, in, in a way, I would say you'd have to switch the roles. Is you yes. make Frank play the, the Josephine role. Yeah. But really, Fra Frank, what happened was they, they were going to, they were, Gonna cast Frank Sinatra. Billy Wilder had a meeting, a lunch meeting set up with Frank. Frank no showed. Billy Wilder said, "Fuck this," and he had actually wanted Jack Lemmon from the beginning. There we go. So he said, "Let's kill." Just Jack gotta Lemmon. give him the. Uh, yeah. Gotta give him the reason. So everything seems to be kind of going well. Yes. And who shows up but our old friend Spats Columbo? <laughs> Out of nowhere, who we'd totally forgotten about. Absolutely right. They had done. Billy Wilder does such a job, uh, such a great job of creating this world down in Florida. This rich, funny, interesting world. These two relationships. He lets the film breathe for a little bit, just long enough for us to have these two established relationships for both Josephine and and Daphne and then Spats Colombo shows yeah. up with a great entrance and apparently we're having some kind of mob convention well it's an Italian uh, appreciates of, uh, appreciators of Italian opera or something like that <laughs> yeah um, and uh, Pat O'Brien's here yes of course and he is. Uh, and we walk in there's this guy flipping a coin and that is Edward G. Robinson Jr. and the flipping of the coin is a reference to George Raft because yep. that's what George Raft used to do and if, you, if any of you are old enough watch the old Looney Tunes cartoons whenever yep. they go and have a Hollywood episode with bugs or anything there's always a guy flipping a coin with, with a cigarette hanging out mm -hmm. of his mouth that is an that is George Raft and I love how George Raft comes back out from that meeting with Little Bonaparte which is of course a reference to Little Caesar right. which is the, the uh, Edward G. Robinson uh, film he says uh, where'd you get that gimmick from yeah yeah something like that where'd you get that stupid gimmick from which is of course a meta moment within that's the movie, what I'm saying which is what you referenced yeah. earlier Steve yeah exactly yeah. Um, it's so great and so this this looks like it's gonna be pretty pretty scary and again even with these supporting characters, we yeah. have nice little bits like the frisking, got the gun in yeah. one pants leg and the bullets in the <laughs> yeah, other. Yeah. Like it's all just really tight and funny. Yeah. Uh, they see, they see, they they see that Spats is here. Yeah. Our guys rush into the elevator. We end up in the elevator with Spats. Don't yeah. I know you from somewhere? The two guys. Yeah. <laughs> you ever been to Chicago? We we, we we cut dead in Chicago, which is a great little <laughs> right, right, double meeting. Great line. Yeah. So we're back in the room. Time to get the hell out of here. So it's time to say goodbye to Sugar. Oh man. Makes a phone call. It's rough. It is rough, especially because Jack is saying to him, you never cared before. You used right. to drop him, which means this guy is not a great guy. Tony Curtis' character is not no. a good guy to women. He has done this over and over again, but there's something different with Sugar. Well, and it's that moment where she describes her dream. Yeah. And you see Tony Curtis's face kind of fall. Yep. And you go, oh, he, he loves her. Yep. To tell the truth, I never closed an eye. I never slept better. I had the most wonderful dream. I was still on the yacht and the anchor broke loose. 
We drifted for days and days. You were the captain and I was the crew. I kept a lookout for icebergs. I sorted your shells and mixed your cocktails. And I wiped the steam off your glasses. And when I woke up, I wanted to swim right back to you. Um, and then what he does to her by sending her the bracelet, in addition to stealing, there's no problem stealing the bracelet. <laughs> for, I mean, let's be clear. Jack yeah. Lemon worked hard for that bracelet. Yeah. He earned it. And he's and he earned it under false pretenses. So the only people who should get that bracelet are Jack Lemon yeah. or to go back to Osgood. <laughs> but he just takes it, sends it over sugar. And this is really treating her like a whore. You know, I mean, that's mm. the... You know, he's just paying her off. Well, he's, well, I don't know, Steve. I think that's a bit harsh. I think he's trying. You know what? I think it's a bit harsh. Yeah, I think As I was saying it, I kind of feel okay. it's a little harsher than it is. I think he's just trying to, in his way, you know, say goodbye to her and give her something sweet. Whereas with the other ones, which Jack refers to in the movie, or Jack Lemmon's character refers to, uh, he's just never even called. He's just ghosted him. Essentially ghosted him for the 50s. Right. But in this, he wants to send her something. He wants to give her something to remember him by. You're right. You're and the right. bracelet and the flowers is that. Is it the right way to do it? Marilyn comes in super depressed. Sure. It's almost irrelevant whatever he gave her because it's, it's his heart that she wants, not any of his gifts. And that's a great thing, too. We see the switch from the woman who wanted security and a rich guy with a yacht. She actually is falling for him, too. Regardless of his money, yeah. it, it doesn't like she gets all that and she goes, oh, I can trade this in and be something with this money, blah, blah, blah. No, she's like depressed. Well, and the same thing that happens with her really happens with Tony because yeah. the moment before Tony's like, this bracelet is our future. Yeah. He, so he trades security yeah. for something compassionate. Right. Well, they got to get out of the hotel because Spatz is here. Right. Yeah. And this is what you mentioned before. Yeah. Let's climb out the window. Once again, let's climb down the uh, what passes for a fire escape at, yeah. at a uh, Florida resort. Yeah. Right? Climbing down the other side. Yeah. Which, by the way, is the Hotel Del Coronado oh. in San Diego. Oh. A beautiful hotel, right? Right. That is a beautiful hotel. Yeah. It's I've, gorgeous. I've been yeah. there. It's a very famous hotel. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, uh, and unfortunately, when they climb down the in front of the window <laughs> whose window do they climb right in front of but, but spats. spats yeah and then spats is the one that recognizes them yep and it may it might not be dames at all blah 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 well and and they find the instruments yep. and that confirms it yeah which is interesting because how would they have known that they shot the the base but once they see the bullet holes they if get you the see bullet holes yeah. in the base and you suspect these people anyway <laughs> that's good that's it's true. a pretty good deal yeah that's why he's the leader. Now we get into this really fun chase where it's, yes. there's like a guy in a wheelchair and we supposed to be the guy in the wheelchair. We're running around <laughs> through the kitchen. And it's a really fun, well-constructed chase yeah. while simultaneously there's a big mobster party and we have a giant cake. We do. Yeah. And who's going to get in the giant cake but Edward G. Robinson Jr. Right. with a machine gun. Right. Like, oh, there's something bad's about to happen. Yeah, yeah. And we'd seen this before with cakes and... I mean, the last movie we had someone jump out of a cake, it was Debbie Reynolds jumping out of a cake and singing in the rain. Right. I much prefer that. <laughs> that would be my taste. Yeah, but then we get Bonaparte talking and we know that he's... Just, we hear that uh, Matchstick Charlie, whatever his name is... Toothpick Charlie. Toothpick Charlie was... Uh, Matchstick Toothpick Charlie <laughs> was... He went to school with little Bonaparte. Yeah. Like, they, they were in... And they grew up for years together. So, he takes the death... The seven people that died, he takes it a little harder. Really? Because, Seriously? Because Toothpick Charlie is one of those guys. He's one of his friends, right? And so, so, and as he's making this speech, yeah. who's hiding under the table yeah. right at Spatz's feet is Jack and Tony. Right. And it's great, too, because, you know, I don't know if he intentionally sp set up the shoes in yeah. order we, that we could see them under the table. Oh, I think so. I yeah. mean, that's just great storytelling. It's from the beginning. You see the bits that are going to be played out just by the shoes. Right. Yeah. But my question is, is when did they come up with the idea for recognizing the shoes under the table did they come up with the cool shoes because they knew who they were going to recognize them under the table oh. or did they come up with the sh cool shoes as a character choice at the beginning of the movie and then realize they could use it under the table I, later on I have a feeling that they came up with it as a character choice at the beginning of the movie because they use it like when the guy drips the coffee right. on him at the beginning his name is Spats whenever yep. he's shown first he's shown the feet coming first yep. the Spats so to me I think it was all played it was all mapped out from the beginning so the bit so that there, you could use it for bits or moments in the well, film. And, and this is this is again why this is such a well constructed yeah, yeah. movie. Agreed. You introduce, you know, it's like the emergency break yeah. or blood type O or all these things right. that pop up again and again is they've introduced them, they use them, they change them, and they become important later on. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, it's really well constructed. Yeah. Uh in comes the cake. Bye bye, spats. Yeah. No more spats. By the way, I love this Bonaparte guy. I love the way he speaks. And do you know that actor is who plays Papa Mouskowitz in the American Tale movies? Oh, really? He no, voices I didn't Papa know that. Mouskowitz. Oh. Yeah. He, he had a very, very long career and uh, 
very, and he looks old when he's doing this part. So it's interesting to see that he still lasted up until the late 90s doing stuff. And so I just love his voice, which is why I want to take a moment to say, like, one of our friends. <laughs> and the thing with the old earpiece, just yeah. brilliant. All yeah. of it just brilliant. No, it's great. Anyway. Uh, in comes Pat O'Brien. Yeah. Our guys escape again. Yes. But again, people spot them. Yeah. Back into being girls again. We call Osgood. We have to get Marilyn. Right. You know, Marilyn's singing her sad song oh, at the end. Break, heartbreaking, man. Yeah. Heartbreaking. And and apparently they don't worry about the fact that they've lost their saxophone and bull fiddle player. Oh, yeah, right. They're not really stressed about that. You gotta live, man. That matters more. Yeah, in walks Josephine. Yeah. Plants a big wet one on Marilyn. Dude, what a great... And great acting by Tony. Once again, like, what's really important when you watch good actors, it's when they're not talking, right? In the scenes when they're not talking and they're watching something and they're having to react to it. You can see it on their face when, when you believe what they're doing. And, and they do it so well, the good ones, you know? Right. And to me, that's what I always watch in actors when they're, not act, when they're not talking. Yeah, totally. What are they doing? And so when he comes down, you, and when he kisses her, and Marilyn's reaction is great. And uh, Sweet Sue's reaction is great as right. well. <laughs> ah, lesbians! <laughs> ah! You know, just all of it, just brilliant, you know, all around. Um, Jack runs off to meet Osgood at the boat. Yes. He Which jumped, they had called <laughs> right. ahead. Right. And, oh, I'm going to bring my friend uh, Josephine. She'll be our bridesmaid. That's <laughs> yeah, so great. Then up shows, Marilyn shows up. Right. Another bridesmaid. Riding her bike. Hopping. Yeah. It's a great moment. Yeah. Hop in the boat. Off we sail. And now we have one of the great little final well, don't, moments. Don't rush to the moment. Don't rush. There's a great little exchange between Tony and Marilyn oh, no, as well. I was going to say that too. Oh, okay. I thought yeah, you were yeah. going to say because like Sorry, two final moments. Two final moments. Yeah. There we go. Yeah. Tony and Marilyn have their moment, which I think is great. <laughs> which... Which, in this film, there are no consequences for the lies they told each other. <laughs> nope. They're like, it's all good. Yeah. It's, all, it's great. We both lied to each other. Swipe the weight slate clean. Let's yep. start over. Yeah. We're going to be, ha he's a saxophone player. Yeah. Everything could, could nothing could go wrong in that relationship. <laughs> and then we have this. Who gambles. Yeah. yeah who this conversation between Osgood <sighs> and Daphne slash Jerry. So good. It is just brilliant, brilliant dialogue. Mm -hmm. And leading to one of the great last lines of any movie of all time. Yeah. That's good. I'm going to level with you. We can't get married at all. Why not? Well, in the first place, I'm not a natural blonde. Doesn't matter. I smoke. I smoke all the time. I don't care. Well, I have a terrible past. For three years now, I've been living with a saxophone player. I forgive you. I can never have children. We can adopt some. But you don't understand, Osgood. Oh, I'm a man. Well, nobody's perfect. When I watched it this time, I laughed out loud again. Yeah. And that's great comedy. Yep. Even, even a joke you've seen, you've seen repeated, you've seen clips of it, you've watched it numerous times, it still works. And it's the two things. It's the ripping off of, or three things. The ripping off of the, of the wig and saying, I'm a man. And Joey Brown looking over and... Just smiling, beaming from ear to ear, going, well, nobody's perfect. And then Jack Lemmon's pan to the, uh, just yeah. off center from the camera of like, oh, well, shit, I can't, I, okay. Well, well <laughs> what's so, what's so, so here's, I'll tell you a little interesting thing about the story that I found out about this last line. Yeah. It was a last minute, right? They wrote no it, surprise. They wrote it the night before. No surprise. And because they're, they're desperate, like, yeah. what's the end of it? What do we have it? What yeah. do we do? And these are the, you know, great joke writers. Yeah. This line came from I.L. Diamond. The other writer, hmm. Billy Wilder, didn't like it. Oh, really? I.A.L. Diamond's wife didn't like it. Oh. And Diamond fought for it. And here was the reasoning. <laughs> is, that, is that like the wife who I saw interviewed, she said, it's just, it's like a nothing line. And, and Diamond said, that's the point. Because structurally what's happening, and I think this is so brilliant. This, yeah. shows, this shows like a deep Zen master understanding of, <laughs> this is like Jedi writing stuff. Yeah. Is that there is a build going on. He goes, oh, I'm not a natural blonde. I can't have children. Yes, yes. I smoke. Each one, each one's going. I can't have children. Is the last one. Right. Each one's getting bigger than the other. And then you and we all know as the audience what the last thing in the build is going to be. We yeah. know he's going to reveal himself. Right. And so what our expectation is is we build, 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 build huge reveal that we need to get a huge reaction. And the fact that it's a nothing line, that he has no huge reaction, <laughs> is what makes it funny. Exactly. And, and, what's, and what's interesting, too, again, this is sort of 2017 looking at it, yeah. is what does that mean? <laughs> what is no, and I, it really always, what does nobody's perfect mean? Who is Osgood Field? Right. What did he know? Right. And then who is Jerry? Like, is he 
like are we saying there's a gay thing here are I, we but i don't think i don't i don't think you can even I don't think you can. How does, I don't think you can put it in a box. And I think that's what I love yeah. about the ending is that it is an open ended ending for a comedy, which is so rare. Right. It is just that he uh, 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 Osgood doesn't care. He really doesn't care because yeah. there's something about Jack Lemmon's uh, essence or energy that is so attractive to him and it's irrelevant to him that he's a man or a woman because he's at that stage in his life where he just wants companionship and someone he cares about. Well, and Jack Lemmon's having a great time and, with Oscar. And Jack Lemmon's happy as hell with this guy I, and, he'll, and he'll have his security for the rest of his life. I mean, there's no sense in the movie. I mean, he's very excited about all the girls yes, and about sure, sugar sure, and all that sure. stuff. So there's no sense. And, and what I, you know, in the end, what I really think it is is that it's funny. Yes, of course. That's I, why it's in the movie. Yeah, it's because yeah. it's funny. But you could break it down and you can say it's like the first like gay love affair on film or whatever right. that was really highlighted or you can say that it's more about well it's about speaking about companionship because he like saw all these girls and he struck out with the one he wanted and he didn't go after anyone else because he probably just has a history of being of failing at women and so here is a security with this guy and maybe this is who he is and this reaction yeah. when he has after he says nobody's <laughs> perfect is more like Huh. Oh, yeah, like, well, maybe I should explore this because Jerry has shown us throughout the whole movie that he can be influenced to do certain things by a strong personality, yeah. especially if money's involved. Well, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> so really, I love it. he's the slut. Well, I don't know if he's a slut, but I, I just know I just love him to death, and I think oh, it's a I great ending. I do, too. A um, uh, little bit about the reception of the yeah. film. They go to have their first test screening, which is in Powell's... Uh, Pacific Palisades, put it in a theater. Yeah. They hand out cards that say a major motion picture release. Nobody laughs. What? Silence. Through the whole movie? That's what they say. Crap. Just death. They go, we got to have another test screening. Here are the two things that change. One is they take out one scene. Apparently there's a scene in the train compartment section yeah. where uh, where Tony Curtis slips into bed, that, that Jack Lemon and Sugar change, switch compartments, and Tony Curtis slips into bed thinking he's getting into bed with Sugar and actually gets into bed with Jack Lemon. Oh. Which, from what I've heard, I mean, it's a funny setup. Right. It sounds like a funny scene, and Wilder made the decision, you know, we've had enough time on the train, time to get off the train. Right. Which I think is a smart decision. Yeah. Here's the only other change they made. On the card they handed out, they put a minor motion picture, not a major motion picture, <laughs> which he thinks clued people in enough that this was a comedy. Yeah. And then and then it was hysterics. And also cheering for an underdog. Yeah. That's the inherent yeah. nature of human beings. Yeah, good point. Yeah. Good point. Um, the movie comes out and it is controversial. The Catholic League ba says we got to ban this. What? They won't play it in Kansas. The Catholic League, the whole state of Kansas says no, we can't. Have is it this. because of the end moment, or is it because they dressed up as women? The whole thing. They said this. Oh. They said this movie promotes homosexuality, lesbianism, and transvestism. Oh my God. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Um, well, this is 1959. That's a good point. <clears throat> Doesn't stop the movie from being a much bigger hit than anyone has suspected. Yeah. And uh, gets nominated for a few Oscars. Didn't win any because one of your other favorite films took them all, which is This is the Year of Ben-Hur. Yeah. 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 So Ben-Hur. So uh, William Wyler wipes out Billy Wilder right. that year. Um, what are we doing Ben-Hur, Steve? I told you. We're doing it Easter next year. Oh, next year? <sighs> well, we could do it sooner, but it seems, I don't know. You know <sighs> all I don't, right, fine. It's the Jesus thing. We have to wait for the Jesus to be crucified. <laughs> Respect. All right. <laughs> Respect to the Jesus. Respect to the Jesus, man. Um, so, uh, and, and really, the, the, the love of this film really builds over time. Oh, for sure. I'm yeah. sure. Yeah. yeah. And you can see why, man. It's timeless. Yeah. I mean, if we're watching in 2017, it still works. It's timeless. Great performances, great script, all of it. Yeah. Yeah, and it's funny because Timeless is exactly right because it seems to be of a certain time, but the jokes aren't stale. No. You know what I mean? Right. It all works. Yeah. Yeah, it's really, really, really funny. Yeah. So, John. Yes. What are your final thoughts on uh, Some Like It Hot? My final thoughts are if you've listened to this podcast, you haven't listened to them, you haven't watched the movie, go back and watch, or go and watch the movie uh, because you're going to be pleasantly surprised. And so I know some people don't like to watch black and white movies, and it's probably some of you listening don't like to watch black and white movies. But I'm telling you, you've got to open yourself up to these classic films because the stuff you admire and love today, the comedic geniuses that you admire and love today are influenced by people like Billy Wilder, like Jack Lemmon, like even Tony Curtis and Marilyn Monroe in a film like this. They're influenced by the scriptwriters as well. They're influenced by the pacing, the, all this that happens in the movie. And the reason we just mentioned why it's timeless is because it still all works and it still is all funny and it gets to the human. It, 
what great comedies do is it gets to the human condition. Yeah. This desire to connect, the desire to find security, this desire to find love, the desire to be, you know, to 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 follow your dreams or to make a, you know, try something to to to, to break out of your situation. And all of that happens in this comedy. And yes, it's it's a you know you're running away from the mafia coming after you or whatever the mob coming after you. But there's so many great funny little human moments that you recognize and connect and see in your friends or see in yourself that I think speaks volumes about this movie. And at the end of the day, I can say a million words, but the only thing that matters is it's incredibly funny and it's a great two hours spent watching a movie. Yeah, I'm sitting here going, I got nothing, I got nothing to add to that. <laughs> I, think you, I think you kind of said it all. The movie's funny. Go watch it. Right, well, as, an, as a director, though, there must be something you can say about oh, it. Oh, sure. I mean, what I've already said whatever, is, that, yeah. is that the tightness of the script is really yeah. the thing to look at. The way yeah. the jokes are structured, how plants and payoffs work, how it builds, it's all really, really well done. Yeah. Absolutely. But mostly, it's funny. Yeah, mostly. You know? Yeah. Like, because in that, like, you know, I have my cinephile analytical brain on most of the time, and it's really useful, and I, I yeah. like that part of myself, and sometimes you got to turn it off and laugh. <laughs> yep. Because this is a funny movie. Absolutely. Okay, so that's what we think about Some Like It Hot. Of course, we want to hear what you think. Please visit us on Facebook at The Cinephiles. You can go to iTunes and subscribe to us there. Please leave us a review on iTunes. I know we've said it over and over again, but it makes a really big difference. It really does. Um, and now you can actually support the show in a new way, which is to join our Patreon page and become yeah. a patron of the cinephiles. We've got a lot of great offers for depending on how you subscribe. Yeah, including like picking a movie that we can talk about, having us mention you on the podcast, having yeah. us talk about uh, whatever you want, like answering questions. We might do extra time with guests where we have fan questions where they stay and talk with us for an extra 20 minutes or 15 minutes answering your questions. Any number of things. We're obviously coming up with stuff. This is, a, this is an amorphous process, so we're going to come up with stuff uh, that we can give back to you all. And of course, course it all depends on how much you donate or commit and how long you plan on donating and committing because if we have we have set up some parameters but we might be adjusting the parameters as we go along so just be patient with us you yeah know, we're just we, trying to figure some of this stuff out yeah it's kind yeah. of a new world but i had to say we are so grateful there are a bunch of people who pledged yes. already some people pledged within an hour of us announcing it, it was amazing it, it means so much to us yes. we really we really honored by your trust in the show mm -hmm. it's really exciting for us and do you have the website steve yes the website is <laughs> patreon.com slash the cinephiles yeah thank you for reminding me no worries it's <laughs> patreon.com slash the cinephiles is there a dash in the cinephiles no no dash okay uh you can also as always watch us on our youtube channel you can uh listen to us on stitcher uh search for us there and anytime you want to reach me i love talking to all of you you can reach me on twitter at sr morris john where can they reach you yeah you guys can always reach me at the roca says t-h-e-r-o-c-h-a-s-a-y-s -A -A uh, uh my outlaw nation podcast drops every thursday morning on the schmoes no plus podcast channel and every friday morning at 10 a.m on collider movie talk over on the collider youtube channel and i think that's it for this yeah. week we will see you next time on The Cinephiles.